Hi, I'm Clark. Today we're going to talk about the diesel engine of a sailing yacht. I'm going to change the oil and talk about some other things I've picked up over the years that will help it run much better out cruising. Today I'm going to talk about the diesel engine on Temptress. Temptress is a sailboat and she travels most everywhere she goes with her sails, but moving on chemical energy is really, really handy. Uh, getting in and out of uh, reefs and uh, bays, there's just nothing like being able to drop her into gear and making her go where you want her to go. Some days there's no wind and I hate to do it, but I have traveled 48 hours straight with the diesel engine running the whole time. It's, it's uncommon because we'll sail even when we go slow, but sometimes it's the right answer. Because of that, and mostly because of like the whole safety thing of being able to drop that engine into gear and having some thrust, the diesel engine is kind of the heart of the yacht. It's um, like one of the biggest safety features on the yacht is to always have power. If you went back to Captain Cook and said, dude, what would you give to be able to always have two knots of forward motion whenever you want it? He'd give anything. It's, it's really something you need when you need it. Uh, especially in storm situations and such when you have to maneuver. Because it's really important, it tends to become more stressful to work on than you would think. Because if you have a failure in your diesel engine and you're thousands of miles from home and parts, it can uh, really affect your life negatively. So, on most boats, um, anything to do with a diesel engine is kind of almost a religion. Well, let's take a look at Temptress's engine. Uh, on Temptress, it's right under here, under the floor, in the uh, galley space. The kitchen is that way, the nav station is that way, if you've seen the boat tour. Today, we're going down this way. This is Temptress's engine. Uh, she always used to have uh, what was called a Perkins 4108. It's a fine engine. It's an older engine. And when Temptress was built, there was basically the only engine that wasn't massive. So she had one, but Temptress is way too big for that engine. And uh, a few years ago, uh, when I took a little break uh, from cruising and took a job for a couple years, I decided some of my windfall was going to be putting a proper sized engine in this boat. So she now has a Yanmar. It's a 4JH5E. And that boils down to it's a four-cylinder Yanmar. This one puts out around 50 horsepower, rated four. And I gotta say, it's a good piece of kit. I really like this engine. Uh, when I was looking for engines and shopping, it came down to this or the Kubota. And those are the only two that would physically fit into Temptress. So um, I gotta say, I wanted the Kubota. I really thought I wanted it over the Yanmar, but the Kubota Marinize was so much more expensive, it just didn't make sense. I got the Yanmar, and I've been absolutely delighted with it, except for one thing. I'll get to that later. Otherwise, I've been uh, very, very happy with it, and I'm happy with my choice. Uh, with this engine, and now that we've got everything set up right, uh, Temptress can easily travel at 7 knots, and that's crazy, because I used to be I motored at 5 on a good day. Well, let me talk about diesel engines in general. Uh, they're devices that take chemical energy, diesel fuel, and turn it into spin, which of course, you know, pushes the boat forward, among other things. They're different than gasoline engines. I won't go into the cycle. It's very interesting if it interests you, but from a practical application, they have very tight tolerances. They sound like they're about to destroy themselves any minute, but they have huge durability. They last and last and last. They use uh, their fuel much more efficiently than a gasoline engine, like per gallon. Basically, because diesel fuel has more energy in it per gallon. Uh, so that means you can have more range than you could if you had a gas engine. You can uh, rely on it more than you can on a gas engine. And uh, probably most importantly, the fuel is an oil. And it doesn't vaporize as readily, and it's actually really hard to light it on fire where gasoline, you know, that becomes a gas very easily and things can go boom if something goes wrong. So it's safer than a gasoline engine. 
The thing about a diesel, though, is you've got to take care of it. You could destroy it in, in short order if you don't. But it's pretty easy. You've got to give it clean fuel. You want to filter the fuel. You want to make sure it comes from a good source. You want to watch your fuel. You don't want any water in the fuel. You don't want any bacteria buildup in the fuel. But we'll talk more about fuel later in this. I have a trick that I use that just worked for me for all these years really, really well. You want to give it nice, clean, fresh oil. So every, whatever the manufacturer says, in the case of this one, I think it's 250 hours, you change the oil. You want to keep it cool. If it overheats, it starts wearing away very quickly. So you want to make sure that it has cooling uh, water in it. It has its own uh, ethylene glycol mix of water, just like your car engine has. And you may want to make sure it has a good flow of salt water that actually does the real cooling. Uh, basically, if you take care of those three things, it will run and run and run. Uh, I guess another thing to mention is how you use it. You would think this is wrong. You would, you, you, you know, like you get a gas engine, you push it hard, you think you're hurting it. With a diesel, you need to push it hard. If you just let it idle a lot or putter along slowly or, God forbid, use its alternator to make electricity as your primary source. So you're like every day running it for an hour and then shutting it off at low power. It will fill up with carbon and it will become a mess and it will hurt itself. You need to at least periodically, but if you really want it to last well, always use it at power. Basically, don't idle around with the thing for very long. Go. In fact, Yanmar suggests if you had to come into a marina and you had to come in slow and everything, when you get there and you tie down, you push it and try to push the dock forward with your dock lines and let the engine work before you shut it off. Get it all up to temperature. Let it clear itself out. Let's talk about what's involved in an engine. Just an overview, no details. This is a diesel engine. Uh, we've got this thing called the expansion tank and it's also the exhaust manifold. So the hot gas comes out and goes through here and goes out the exhaust pipe. Uh, it's also where the cooling water is stored. And if you notice, this thing looks a lot like a radiator cap. It is a radiator cap, just like on your car. And it works just the same way. This is where you put the coolant into the engine. Uh, this little area here, this little plug is where you put in the new oil. Underneath this are the valves. This is the valve cover. That's the, uh, where the, the lifters and all are. Diesel engines don't have spark plugs and they don't have a carburetor. They squirt their fuel as an aerosol right into the combustion chamber just when it's needed. And that's done with the injection pump which is down there and it comes up through these hoses. And these hoses are made out of steel because the fuel is at incredibly high pressure when the pump pumps it. And uh, there's no signal, no electrical uh, device that says go. It's just the fuel pressure. So if this was made out of rubber, it would just stretch. So anyway, these fire the fuel into the injectors and the injectors squirt it right in where the fire actually happens. It's like a flamethrower. The intake manifolds over on this side, uh, it's just a way for the air to come in. There's an air cleaner back here, but on a marine diesel, it's not much of an air cleaner. It's just kind of a filter so big pieces of hair can't go in. Uh, it's not like a car where you're worried about dust because <laughs> it's running here in our living room, so it better not be very dusty. On the front of the engine, we have uh, an alternator and that makes electricity for the batteries and for the engine's own use. And we have a belt system that drives that. Uh, more on that later. We have some fuel filters. This is the on-engine fuel filter. It's like the final filter. And uh, I think I'm going to go into filters pretty deep later because they're vitally important. And finally, there's the oils filter. Just like your car, it's down here. Uh, I'll grab one. Looks like this. It just, you spin it off and you spin on a new one. Now, um, I only change the oil filter every other time I change the oil. Uh, I'm sure people will complain about that, but that's what I choose to do. And I've kept an, a diesel engine running for the last 30 years, so uh, it seems to work. Uh, so I won't be changing this today. But you just unscrew it and put the new one on. You need a, a special wrench for that. The last thing I'm going to talk about in this overview is the dipstick. And this is how you check the uh, level of the oil in the engine. And it's just like your car's dipstick, same thing exactly. On some boats, and the Anmar is one of them, you actually suck the oil out of the engine through the dipstick tube. 
it's like a siphon that goes right to the very bottom. So if you put a pump, a, a hose over it that makes a seal, and you suck on it, you pull the oil right out of the engine. Other engines, you might need to take a tube and shove it down the dipstick hole to uh, uh, pump the oil out. And on some engines, the one I had last, someone has had the foresight to take out the drain plug and put a hose there so that you can pump out the oil that way. Uh, that's a very good way to do it as well. Um, you, you don't want this to be difficult because this is something you're going to do very often throughout your life owning the boat. In this video I'm going to change the oil and that's pretty straightforward but I'm also going to talk of a few things that I've discovered over the years that tend to fail. And on this engine I've fixed them before they fail. I've actually modified and improved the engine a little bit in areas that are problematic and have been problematic on other engines I've had over the last 30 years. So uh, I'm going to give you all my tricks and what I do to an engine before I leave. Okay, for changing the oil, the first step in changing the oil is to start the engine and run it. Bring it up to operating temperature. Uh, put it in gear and let it do some work. Now I just, we're on anchor, so I just put it in gear, put it in reverse and let it try to set the anchor for the last 10 minutes or so. When you see the temperature gauge come up to, you know, 180 or so where it should be, then you're ready to change the oil. Now, the uh, oil in the engine, if it's been sitting there, there's going to be some dirt and some crap in it, and it's all going to sink to the bottom. So starting the engine mixes it all up. And also running the engine and heating the oil up makes it thinner, and it's easier to get it all out. We want to change all the oil, right? So we do that. All engines basically are the same thing for changing the oil. You take out the old oil, you might change the filter, and then you put in some new oil. Quick uh, list of what we need. Uh, we need a way to get the oil out. And I use this. Uh, as I mentioned, this just fits over and makes a seal on the dipstick tube itself. And then I pump this and it sucks the oil out of the engine. Uh, this is a very old brass pump. Um, it came with the boat on the old engine. It was plumbed directly into the engine's drain. If you ever find one of these in the swap meet, buy it. It's a wonderful, wonderful little pump. Better than the plastic ones you can buy nowadays. Once you get the oil out, you'd want to change the filter if it's the stage where you change the filter and you need a little wrench that goes under that. Get that at an automotive store. Same thing as always. You unscrew that with something to catch the oil that always leaks. Paper towels do it. Get that out, get it in a bag, and then screw a new one on. And then the other tool is a way to get the oil back in the engine. And unless your pouring is way better than mine, you'll want a funnel. And of course, oil and uh, something to put the old oil in. Old oil container. All right, let's get at it. Forgotten one step. I didn't take the uh, filler cap off. It's a good sign the engine doesn't have bad leaks because I actually pulled a vacuum on the engine, sucking the oil out. Got rather hard to pump out, so you'll want to make sure you do that. Anyway, I released that, air went in, oil came out easily, all was well. Okay, I'll take this off now. No, I'm not throwing it away, but I'm temporarily putting it in the garbage can just because that's a plastic bag. I'll clean that all up later. So, let's put the new oil in. Make very sure your funnel's clean. Uh, if it picks up dust and stuff, that dust would be going right into the engine. If that dust is gritty, uh, that's really bad for the engine. I keep this funnel in a clean spot, but still I like to give it a little wipe down as much as I can easily. 
This engine uses about a gallon when you change it, but uh, you pour most of it in and then just watch the dipstick. And then of course, I won't be doing this on the video, but you uh, run the engine a little bit and check the dipstick again because the uh, oil level might change a little bit as oil collects in different places. Well, I'm using Shell Rotella here because that's what Yanmar recommended. Um, anything that's a d diesel certified oil is going to be just fine. Uh, I'm using 1540 because that's what's recommended for this engine for this temperature range. Uh, generally, you use a thicker oil when it's hotter and a thinner oil when it's not. The ten, or 1540 number, 40 is kind of the weight of the oil, and it is the weight of the oil, and it refers to how thick it is. So this is a rather thick oil, but this is called a multi-grade oil. And then the 15W, the W stands for winter, and in short, it acts like a 15 weight oil when it's cold and acts like a 48 weight oil when it's up to temperature. So you're getting the protection of a 40 weight oil, but a real 40 weight oil, if it was a cold winter Nebraska day, the engine will barely even turn over. It'll be so thick. Um, for a yacht sailing in the tropics, you really don't need multi-grade oil. But it's what's available, so that's what I bought. Let's see how we've done for the oil level so far. Okay, I need some more. Okay, when you think you've got enough, allow the oil to go through the engine. That just takes a few seconds to get down to where it needs to be to be measured. And let's check the dipstick one time. Okay. I, don't, I think it needs just a skosh more. When you measure the oil, make sure the dipstick goes all the way in. Because it, the length of the dipstick is what's telling you everything. If you only put it in three quarters of an inch shy, it'll measure wrong. Great. Now the dipstick here has two little dashes on it, and you can see the oil is between the two. Let me wipe it off. These are the two marks, and we were up to about here, so we're well within the good range. Uh, I will eventually, before I put the engine away, I won't bore you with it, but I'll start the engine, let it drain down again, and check the oil again, just in case what's in different parts of the engine have collected some oil since I drained it. But that's it. You put the dipstick back in, and uh, you want to run the oil uh, engine. Uh, make sure there's no leaks. If you had changed the uh, oil filter, there could be a leak there if you didn't get it on right. Usually it's not a question of putting it on not tight enough, uh, honestly, what usually causes a leak is the old gasket got stuck to the engine and you took it off and didn't notice it. And then when you put the new one on, you double gasket it. And if you double gasket, these things will just leak terribly. So uh, don't do that. Also, when you put on the new gasket, take a little bit of the old oil and just run it around the gasket so that uh, it makes a nice seal and it slides nicely going on. Well, that's about all there is for changing the oil. Just put the cap back on, of course, and you're good to go. Let's talk about other issues. Um, I like the Anmar engine. I like everything about it except one thing. It's starter. I have learned you really can't trust these little starters much. On the other hand, they're very cheap. <laughs> so you can buy one uh, very inexpensively. They all come from China as far as I can tell. Uh, the brush holders tend to fail. Um, they can bind up really easily. So take a spare starter with you. Uh, a diesel engine is a very valuable, very expensive, big device, wonderful device, and it's worthless if you don't have an electric starter because it's way too heavy for you to crank. So spare starter. And if you have a problem, it's real easy to change out. Just a couple wires, two bolts, out it comes, put the other one in. 
run the engine, get out, do whatever you needed to do. There must have been a reason you pushed the button. But then later on, take the old starter part, look at it. You probably find out that, oh, this got bound up. It needs a little bit of lubrication or all oh, the brushes are stuck. But I think I got them working pretty good. Clean it up, put it back together, and then that could be your new spare. Otherwise, um, I have had engines running for a very, very long time. And usually everything runs pretty good as the factory builds it. But if you get any rust on the flywheel or any of the front pulleys of the engine, they'll eat through V-belts as you watch. They'll just make a mess. So I've switched to a, a, a ribbed belt, a flat belt. It's what's on modern cars today. Uh, it doesn't look like it would be anywhere near as prone to failure, even if you had corrosion on the pulleys. Uh, the, you have to replace the pulleys, but it comes as a kit, and it's not terribly expensive. I mean, it's a boat thing, but I got this from a company called Electromax, and uh, they did a really good job. Um, in fact, they did such a good job on their pulleys and everything. They're machined out of aluminum. They go over the other pulleys for the most part, so you don't have to do a lot of heavy work, just kind of a bolt-on process, that I then bought their alternator uh, because I wanted a spare alternator. Okay. So here's our belt system. Uh, this is the main crank of the, uh, the engine itself. This is where the power comes out of. And there was a V-belt pulley under here. And Electromax sends you this aluminum thing you put right over top and screw it in. Uh, it fits very well. They did good machining. And you can see it has ribs and it locks into these little ribs on the, the belt. Then they give you this pulley here. Uh, this goes onto the water pump. And that's very, very simple. You take those four bolts off, put them on bang change it out you can either change alternators or uh, it comes with a pulley that you put on to your old alternator I put the pulley that came with the kit on our old alternator but I bought their 140 amp alternator because it looked like a good alternator and this was an option it's an idler pulley that kind of changes the angle here and I just decided to go for it it's unnecessary and finally, this little bar here that's going to replace the uh, tensioner for the alternator. This is worth the price of admission right here. Adjusting the tension on a V-belt is very difficult. You've got to pull the alternator back with some kind of a lever, and on the Yanmar there's nothing to lever it on, and you've got to get it very, very tight and then tighten it up. Well, this thing, you just loosen it up, and then you just adjust this bolt here, and it puts it right where you want it. When it feels good, you just tighten it back up. Easy, easy. That's the kind of thing you'll start having a slipping belt. You know, it never happens when you're coming out of a marina on a nice day. It's going to happen when you need the engine and you're rolling all over the place. And when I would have a V-belt here, it would start slipping, and I would have to tighten it up. And sometimes I'd be at sea in the ocean doing this, my tools falling into the bilge, it was just so great to have this easier piece of kit. So I've put the whole kit on with the other alternator, changed out its pulley so that it would work with the flat belts, and then I bought their 140 amp alternator, which is the one I'm actually using. Uh, if you're going to go a long ways, it's a good idea also, I guess I'm adding things to the list, to have a spare alternator. The alternator itself can fail and not make electricity, and that's sad. But what's worse is if the bearings in the alternator fail, because then it won't spin, it'll burn out the belt, and that same belt is running an, a water pump that cools your engine. So now you don't have an engine. So there are these relatively cheap parts that if you have a spare of, it can save you from the whole engine going down. Uh, check the description. I'll put links to all this stuff uh, to make it easier for you. And then you get to look at pictures, because... It's kind of a dark engine room. I'm sure that we haven't shown you what it looks like in a very good way. Finally, let's talk about the diesel oil itself and how to filter that. You definitely want to filter that. You never know what you're really buying. There could be anything in it. There could be water in it, algae. That's common. I mean, there could be little rocks in it. You just don't know. You certainly don't want that going into your engine. Because of all the things the engine needs to be perfect, it needs its fuel to be absolutely perfect. It's way fussier than a gas engine about its fuel. So you want fuel filters. In fact, you want multiple fuel filters. The engine comes with a filter from the factory that uh, is 
that the fuel goes through just before it goes into the injector pump. And that's a very fine filter, and you will probably never even change that filter because you're going to add another filter in front of it. Almost everybody buys Raycor filters. I'm sure there's other companies, but it's just they seem available and they seem to work well, and you can find filter elements for them all over the place because kind of everybody buys them. So everybody puts a Raycor up front, and they actually just refer to it as the Raycor. So a simple circuit for the fuel will start at the fuel tank, You'll run a line to the Raycor pre-filter, then you run it to the engine's filter. Uh, the engine will take some fuel out of that filter area to run itself, but it also ejects a lot of the fuel right back to the tank. And the reason it does that is it's actually using that fuel movement to cool its uh, injection system, to keep itself running cool, to lubricate things, various other reasons. But uh, an engine has um, uh, fuel coming to it and fuel going back, so you have this round circuit. The engine has a fuel pump on it. Uh, sometimes it's mechanical. In the case of the Yanmar, it's actually electrical. And it runs whenever the engine's running, and it's keeping fuel moving around in this cycle so that it has good, clean, cool fuel available to it all the time. So, you get your system, and you ask yourself, how often should I change my filters? Now, I know people that change them every year. I know people that go a little extra mile and put a vacuum gauge on their filter. The idea being when the filter starts getting plugged up, that pump will start pulling a vacuum, trying to pull fuel through the filter. And it will uh, say, hey, um, it's starting to pull some vacuum here. Time to change out the filter. Good idea. I do something different. And uh, it's worked so well for me. What I've done to Temptress is I've added another Rycor, and uh, I've added a little diverter valve so that I can have the oil, the fuel oil, go through the system I described or divert it all and go through this other filter and right back to the tank. Then I've added a, a pump, a particular type of pump called a rotary vane fuel pump. They're not very expensive to the system so that if I turn on that pump and I change that valve, I can run the fuel from the tank through the filter and back to the tank without starting the engine. So I can clean my fuel just because I feel like cleaning my fuel. I can also, with a manifold system I put on, because they have multiple tanks, I can get fuel from anywhere and put it back to anywhere. So I can clean my fuel from one tank to another. I can also just move fuel from one tank to another. If I decide she's too heavy on that side, I might transfer all the fuel to a tank on this side. All of that is handy and it's nice and I'm really glad I did it. I did it for the ability to move fuel and the ability to clean the fuel, but it turns out it saved me so much money in fuel filters. So here's how I change my filters. I don't. I don't until I have a problem, and I don't even know I have a problem until the engine starts running badly. You'll learn how your engine runs when it's not getting fuel. Usually it actually surges, like it revs up uh, before it shuts off. So as soon as I hear something wrong with the engine, I run down and I hit a switch and it turns on that pre-pump. And my logic is, if that filter was able to pump fuel at ambient pressure and supply the engine yesterday, it's not going to be so gummed up on the day that it finally is getting a problem that adding that 8 PSI of fuel from this other pump doesn't overcome it. And in fact, it will overcome it for quite some time because it's a, a significant amount of extra pressure. So I uh, don't even change the filter right away. Uh, in the Pacific, a lot of the anchorages were really rolling and really horrible. And I remember once when I got bad fuel in San Diego, only time I ever remember getting bad fuel, I switched to the tank that I had gotten in San Diego down in Mexico. And within, I don't know, an hour, the engine started searching. I hit the switch. Uh, I was fine. I... Uh, uh, switched to another tank, of course. Continued on, got to where I was going for the night, but it was rolly, and I would have made a mess, honestly, if I changed the filter, because the boat was rolling. So I just decided, till I find a nice anchorage, I'll just keep using this other fuel, and I'll use my pump every time. So I would turn on the pump, start the engine, uh, get wherever I'm going to go, turn off the engine, turn off the pump. That was my process. A little later, I changed the oil, uh, sorry, changed the filter in the, the fuel oil uh, Rycor. 
I uh, ran all the uh, fuel out of that tank into another empty tank once I emptied one, you know, months later, through my other Rycor to clean it up. Uh, probably did that twice to put it back where it was. And I was fine. Now since then, I believe I've always had good fuel. And I believe I've had it because I haven't had a filter plug up. The only other time I remember changing the filter since then, and I believe that was in 2000, was when I changed this engine. So as long as you have good fuel, you're not going to have to change filters. Why waste the whatever it costs and the hassle and the smell to change filters when you can do it this other way? Uh, the filter elements are actually pretty pricey, and I think this pump's like 50 bucks, maybe? And then you get all those other advantages. So I guess that's the last of my little uh, words of wisdom of what to do to an engine before you go off cruising. Thanks for watching the video. I hope this is helpful. A diesel engine doesn't have to be scary, especially if you take care of it before something really goes wrong. Um, if you like the video, give me the thumbs up, comment, and all that good stuff that tells other people this is worth watching. And uh, have a great day. Thank you.